Imagine a river, hot enough to kill you, said to be the home of a powerful Amazonian water spirit. That place is real, and I've been there. It's the Shanaitin Pishka, the boiling river of the Amazon. My name is Andres Russo, and I am a geothermal scientist and conservationist. As a boy in Lima, my grandfather told me this crazy story about the search for the lost city of gold. There was a detail in the story about a river that boiled. I certainly imagined it, but never, never really dwelled on it. It was just a detail. It's getting much hotter. Turns out this place is real. There's the boiling river. This part. Pretty hot. So the boiling river is located in the heart of the central Peruvian Amazon. The hottest temperature I've measured was over 210 degrees Fahrenheit. To put that into everyday terms, the average coffee is roughly 130 degrees. It's hard to physically imagine that much hot water. You stick your hand in and you will see second and third degree burns in a matter of seconds. I've seen a number of animals fall into the boiling river, everything from birds to reptiles. Complex organisms like us, we don't do well at those high temperatures. We literally start to cook on the bone. Feeling that heat come into you, breathing in this thick, hot air where you can feel the air heating you up inside your nose, you can feel it going into your lungs, you can feel the presence of your lungs because of the heat of the air. I, it still gives me goosebumps. The true name of the boiling river is Shanaitin Pishka, and that means, according to one of the local shamans, boiled with the heat of the sun. It's spectacular. It's, this place has totally redefined what it means to be sacred for me. I think once you've experienced something that's truly moved you, you love it, and you can't let that go. Every year, about 8 million tons of waste flowers are dumped into the Indian rivers. All the pesticides and insecticides that were used to grow these flowers mixes with the river water, making it highly toxic. We decided to do something about it. Indians depend on the river water for drinking water, for our agriculture and for our basic needs. In Hinduism, we Hindus go to temples and offer flowers to our gods. Once these flowers have been offered to our gods, they become sacred. They cannot be dumped in the dustbin. So according to religious customs, they are dumped into the river Ganges. Once these flowers have been dumped in the river, it creates havoc in the fragile ecosystem of the water body. We had decided that we want to solve the flower problem, but we didn't have a solution. So we started going to temples begging for the waste flowers. But turned out no one would trust us. Boys coming and asking you for waste. You're not sure what they'll do with it. So slowly and slowly we started with around 12 kilos of waste flowers. And in a month we started collecting 80 kilograms of waste flowers. Today, our trucks go to the temple directly, collect these waste flowers in bins and bring them to our facility. We have a capacity of about 8.7 tons of waste flowers per day. These flowers are treated to remove all the pesticides and insecticides and convert them into products. We make charcoal-free incense sticks, bathing bars, and now we are launching biodegradable alternative styrofoam made from these waste flowers. River Ganges is the holiest river in the world. It says a dip in the River Ganges can remove all your sins. When I see River Ganges in the state that it is in, I feel sad and I feel that the status quo needs to be changed. Montana is a landlocked state. It blows my mind every day, but there is waves in the river and you can surf them on surfboards just like you would in the ocean. We have a huge surf culture here in Missoula. 
My name is Kevin Benhart Brown. I go by KB and I own Strongwater Mountain Surf Company. We are the original mountain surf shop and still the only surf shop in the state of Montana. I mean, it's cowboy country here. Surfing is in my soul. One of my very first earliest memories at the age of three is visiting my grandparents in San Diego and seeing surfing in the ocean. And for whatever reason, I've been kind of searching for surfing my whole life. And I happen to be here in Missoula, Montana and tapped into river surfing. In the river, um, it's a standing wave. So the wave is essentially stationary. You're going back and forth across the wave, but the wave is kind of in one place. The water's coming at you. It's pretty amazing. You know, we've built a really strong river surf community here. There's just a ton of support and good vibes and good energy. This whole connection with nature correlates directly with kind of that same vibe that you get in the ocean. Not a lot of people know about river surfing, but there's river surfing communities popping up everywhere and it's just starting to explode. For me personally, it's about doing what people don't think you can do and proving that you can do it and you know, just getting out and having a good time, sharing the sport. It's exciting and fun to be on this whole new frontier. Floating markets have been at the center of communities in Thailand for hundreds of years. They were originally built along canals and rivers at a time when water transport played an important role in daily life. One of the most popular in Thailand is the Ampawa Floating Market, 45 miles from Bangkok. It stretches 30 miles along a canal on the Mekong River. And today, hundreds of vendors use the Ampawa Floating Market to sell and cook a wide variety of delicious Thai dishes. ส่วนประกอบของเอ่อเบื้องต้นก็คือเราได้มังดามาจัดทะเลตัวมาสดๆแล้วก็ปลาทูเนี่ยคําว่าปลาทูเนี่ยมันเหมือนกันทั่วโลกอ่ะแต่ปลาทูไม่กองอร่อยเพราะว่ามีแพงต้นปลาทูนี่ต้มยําก็
roads. They don't have them. The mensen die uh, zijn aangewezen op een boot. Uh, sommigen kunnen dan wel met de fiets op de plek van bestemming komen. En anders moet het lopen gebeuren. Ik ben bij Derden, een local burgemeester van Gietoren. Nou, er zijn 2400 uh, inwoners ongeveer en uh, 1100 huizen. En boats. Lots of boats. Nou, goede dag zitten er ongeveer zo'n zo 500, 600 bootjes hier wel op uh, hier in Gietoren. Dat is Jan, one of the town's resident boat builders. He's known for Poonters, a flat bottom boat that originated in Gietor. It is well ontstaan in Gietor, but momentaneel gaan ze echt over de over de hele wereld. And where there are boats, there are bridges, 167 to be exact. And just like any town, people need their groceries, their furniture, their beer, you name it. But in Gietor, they must pass through Anton. He's the town's bridge guard. Als de brugwachters ermee stoppen, dan ligt het ligt het dorp stil. Op een drukke dag uh, ongeveer 300 boten, waar we dus de opening voor zorgen. One of those boats is the fireboat. This is Bart and Eric. In ieder geval de plek waar we uh, dus met de auto niet kunnen komen. Uh, dat is natuurlijk hier in het dorp Gietoor uh, ja, veel plek. Uh, veel woningen aan het water, dus voor, voor blussingen van brand gaan we eruit. Maar ook voor het uh, redden van, uh, van eventueel drenkelingen, boten die uh, zinkende zijn of ja, noem maar op. Uh. And this is Jan. He's in charge of maintaining the natural lands around Gietorn. Nou, alles rond Gietorn, de meeste weilanden en, en, uh, zijn gewoon per boot bereikbaar. En uh, ja, de koeien op de boot, dat zien we in Nederland niet zoveel meer. Maar dat gebeurt dus in Gietorn nog wel. Voor ons is het uh, eigenlijk normaal. <laughs> so, there you have it. The residents of Gietorn proved that a life without asphalt, traffic and trips to the DMV can be pretty damn great. Roads? Who needs them? Bye, Gitorn.